information that is agriculture. In addition to teaching, Bob has an extension appointment in the Landscape Nursery and Urban Forestry program, and his role there is to provide accurate and timely diagnostics of insect pests. He also makes recommendations for pest control and writes about current trends in pest identification and management. And he also acts um, to overall resources as an overall resource for the green industry in Massachusetts. So I'm very happy to have you, Bob, and um, hopefully uh, you are right there. Yes, I am, Laura. You, can you hear me okay? Okay. We can hear you Thank perfectly. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Then I will begin, correct? Yes, yes, that's Thank great. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm one of the newbies here, as you can probably tell. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thanks for listening in today. Uh, my task today is to talk to you about winter moth, which was a, a new pest for us in Massachusetts for about the last uh, eight or nine years. And it popped up quite unexpectedly in the, the landscape areas and the nursery. And it was after a couple of years that we realized it was becoming a big problem in, in blueberries as well. We had a number of growers in southeastern Massachusetts that experienced uh, such damage from this insect that they had virtually no crops for uh, two, three years in a row until we were able to get a handle on this. So I'm going to explain to you um, our experience and what perhaps you can do to be on the lookout for this with monitoring and management techniques. Uh, back in 2000, 2001, in Plymouth County, Massachusetts, southeastern Mass. We had an outbreak of this little insect called fall canker worm. You're probably familiar with it. It's a native uh, inchworm. And periodically, it can go into outbreak phase, and it can be a problem for two or three years until natural controls catch up to it again. And, and then, usually, the way that that story goes is that the insect is then knocked down into very small population numbers and we don't see it for for quite a while maybe 10 15 or 20 years in that area and population started to build of fall canker worm it's a little green looper as hopefully you can see uh, it has a distinguishing feature in that uh, loopers or inchworms only have two to three pairs of pro legs and I'm going to try to use the pointer which are the abdominal legs, and bear with me, I'm trying to, there we go, uh, the abdominal legs. And fall canker worm, the first pair of their pro legs are very short, and it's said that it's a half a pair, so uh, a very distinguishing feature of fall canker worm is that it has two and a half pairs of pro legs. It's usually green. When the population numbers go into high density mode, the caterpillars turn very dark black with uh, light colored stripes on the body. These two caterpillars that you are looking at now, uh, both fall canker worm, they were both collected at the exact same time on the same branch on an oak tree in southeastern Mass. The population was in a uh, phase change going to the dark color. But usually they're green. And this is what we had occurring in southeastern Mass. There we go. Laura, I have a screen that popped up that I want to get rid of here. Now I've created, sorry, there, I'm back. So after uh, two or three years of population of fall canker worm building dramatically, uh, Deborah Swanson, our extension specialist in southeastern Mass, uh, called me and she said, the problem's getting worse, what do we do? And I said, well, you know, I told you in the beginning it was probably going to get worse for a few years till nature uh, caught up with it. And then she started saying, you know, I don't, I'm not so convinced it's fall canker worm anymore. We had these other little green inchworms and she sent some to me. Uh, here in Amherst, and I immediately realized it, it was not fall canker worm. We still had some fall canker worm in that population, but mostly we had these little green caterpillars. Uh, I spent a while trying to identify it and was pretty convinced it was not uh, a native insect here. Um, I moved it on to Jeff Bettner and our 
department, and he was unable to identify it. It went to Joe Elkington, our forest entomologist, who sent it to Rick Hobeck at Cornell, and uh, also David Wagner at UConn. And both of them came back almost the same day and said, you have winter moth, which is native to Europe. It has been known to be in Nova Scotia uh, since the late 1940s, and it can be problematic, as a little geometric uh, looper. And suddenly, we had a new exotic here in Massachusetts. And unfortunately, this is a little video just to show you that it, it just is an innocuous looking little green uh, inchworm or looper, but I don't believe we're going to get this quick time to play, so I will just move on. Fall canker worm uh, has a pretty wide host range. Uh, this native caterpillar is found on oaks and maples, birches, crab apples, and a number of other deciduous hosts. We primarily see it as a problem in oaks and maples. Winter moth shares many of the same host plant. It too is a generalist. In England, in northern England, Scotland, uh, it's a problem with uh, Sitka spruce and heather, and, uh, but mostly it feeds on deciduous plants. And you can see that I've listed apple and blueberry as being uh, potential hosts for winter moth. Where did winter moth come from? At the time, we did not know. We do know now, thanks to the work of Joe Elkington. You'll hear me mention Joe Elkington quite a bit. Uh, he, as far as I know, is the, has the only active winter moth research program going on in the uh, eastern uh, part of North America uh, right now. But he has done some very interesting work, and I will pass some of that along to you in this talk. The insect is native to Europe, including England. It was found in Nova Scotia, as I mentioned, in 1949, mostly in apples and oaks. Uh, it popped up in British Columbia in 1976, you know, several thousand miles from Nova Scotia. And we believe it was moved there accidentally, perhaps on nursery stock or plant material. Uh, other finds have been in Washington State and Oregon, and these have been in commercial blueberries. In British Columbia, it's more of a uh, deciduous tree problem. And now it's very well established in eastern Massachusetts and most of Rhode Island. It may be moved, as I mentioned, with uh, plant material. When the caterpillars are through feeding, they, they spin down on a silken web to the soil, burrow in an inch or less, and pupate almost instantly. And if plants are uh, dug and, and bald and burled after containerized or, or moved, then they insect could very well move with it. Winter moth has probably been in Massachusetts much longer than we realize. Uh, it's, it was in low numbers, I'm sure, for many years. It was just in the background. Uh, and it is remarkably similar in a number of ways to our native fall canker worm. They share many of the host plants as we've seen. The adult female moths are, are wingless. They're similar to fall canker worm, and I'll show you pictures of that in a few moments. The adult moths are active at the same time as fall canker worm, which happens to be around Thanksgiving time. And winter moth, being a new introduction, has very limited natural controls here in the Northeast at this time. So here's winter moth on the left and fall canker worm on the right. Their eggs, the female uh, winter moth uh, deposits her eggs rather loosely on substrate. Usually it's uh, the tree trunks. And the fall canker worm lays its eggs in clusters, these little barrel-shaped eggs usually packed together on stems or tree trunks primarily. The area that's enclosed in the red line is pretty much where we're having a severe problem with winter moth right now. This work, and the slide looks a little busy here, but I'm just going to highlight uh, what I think are some of the important parts for today. The magenta color is where winter moth has been picked up in, in pheromone traps. Joe Elkington's lab, Jeff Bettner works with Joe Elkington, have been doing extensive uh, survey work throughout the Northeast and, and uh, cooperating with other 
researchers in different parts of the world to try to get a handle on winter moth and DNA and relationships. And it's thought now that our winter moth population here in Massachusetts is from the Nova Scotia population. Its DNA matches uh, most closely to that. You can see in uh, coastal Nova Scotia the magenta dots and then coming down through Maine and New Hampshire and then the cluster of it into Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Uh, Maine and New Hampshire are unaware that they have winter moth. There were until uh, uh, Joe Elkington had done this work and picked them up in traps, but the population levels are so low they've never been problematic. The bottom map uh, has DNA and genitalia and uh, a lot of things we don't need to worry about too much, but again the magenta represents the uh, known areas of winter moth and Joe has been looking at the potential for a connection between cold hardiness and winter moth and you can see that it's coastal Nova Scotia, coastal Maine, coastal Massachusetts, New Hampshire all in that zone 6, uh, zone 6A slash 5B uh, and it's quite possible that Winter moth may never venture into the zone five or, or colder. And uh, that's something that Joe will continue to research to uh, see if he can have uh, more of an understanding of that. So it's possible winter moth may just stay coastal and continue to move southward um, for quite a ways, but uh, maybe not westward and northward in New England. This picture is from an organic uh, apple orchard on Cape Cod taken several years ago and the defoliation you're looking at here in early June was from winter moth. It, it can be a very voracious feeder of foliage. The life cycle of winter moth that hatches very early in the spring here in eastern mass it would be approximately mid-April. This last year, I think it was April 16th, we saw the first hatch. So somewhere around 20 to 50 growing degree days, roughly, uh, or uh, base 50 for that. So fairly early. The leaves have not emerged at this time. What the winter moth really wants to find are buds that are just beginning to swell, and they wriggle into those buds and, and feed, and they can cause great damage within those buds. Uh, there has been some research done in years past that shows that established winter moth populations time their hatch uh, with that of the phenology of the plant. And if they're in an oak stand, oaks tend to break bud later than, say, maple, uh, they may not emerge for you know a week, 10 days, or more later than they would in a maple stand. Once the buds open, the larvae become free feeders. And they can be managed uh, like any free feeding lepidopteran caterpillar. But if we have a lot of caterpillars in a bud, if we have a cool season where, where bud break is delayed, then those caterpillars can create quite a bit of damage and buds may never open. They consume both uh, foliar and flower buds. And that's the problem with, for the blueberry growers is that the, the larvae will eat the... Uh, uh, reproductive parts of the flowers and uh, no flowers, no fruit of course. Uh, they feed for five or six weeks and then late May, usually that last week in May, sometimes into early June if we're having a cool season, uh, and then they, they spin down to the soil and pupate where they stay until about Thanksgiving time and then emerge as adult moths. The eggs in the upper left corner are scattered loosely. They, they're white at first. They turn sort of a pinkish color. Um, as the embryo matures, they become a deeper red. And just before hatching, they become this beautiful deep blue color. And you can tell if they're close to hatching when they do achieve that, that coloration. The larvae hatch, seek out swelling buds. If the buds are not swollen, uh, the larvae may spin silk and balloon to, uh, in their hope to land on a plant that does have buds in a suitable uh, phenology for them to enter. Feed for five weeks, drop to the soil, and then the adults. 
This picture was just taken a couple of weeks ago in southeastern Mass, and these are two female winter moths, and all those little white spots on this structure uh, are their eggs, very freshly laid eggs. They will lay their eggs on anything if they, if they have to. This is a piece of lichen, uh, about an inch in length, and you can see just the little red eggs on there. This is a first instar winter moth caterpillar's dream. Blueberry buds that are just starting to swell and they wriggle in through the bud scales to get to the center of the plant and start feeding. Uh, in 2003, Deborah Swanson and I uh, talked to Joe Elkington about this and he deemed it important enough to go take a look at it. Dominic Marini, who's pictured here in the middle, uh, was an extension specialist in southeastern Mass, since retired, and he has a small farm, and he was having uh, a terrible time, mostly his blueberries with winter moth, and here we are peeling buds, looking for the little winter moth. As you peel the buds, when they're in this stage, they are very tiny, and this picture shows here from this, from a, uh, thank you, from a, uh, I believe this was a Norway maple bud, but you can see at the bottom the head capsule and the three pairs of legs, and it's less than a millimeter in size. Deborah Swanson refers to this as looking like a little eyelash when you peel open that bud in the spring and the pristine uh, pale green tissue in there, and all of a sudden there are these little things in there, little lines that just look like they don't belong, and usually it's a winter moth. And this is a very important uh, stage for monitoring. The larvae will chew holes in the foliage, and then as the bud continues to expand, or the leaves continue to expand from the bud, uh, those holes become more exaggerated. The larvae are still there and continue to be free feeders and to cre create more injury. This is a Norway maple bud, and you can see uh, two larvae in there. That's a penny that's at the bottom of that bud. Uh, and they're, they're starting to become free feeders. And they will completely defoliate their host plant. This work, again, was done by uh, Joe Elkington, uh, taking samples in six different towns. The dark red line for Falmouth. Falmouth is on Cape Cod. And we really didn't start seeing winter moth out there 2005 or 2006. Now it's pretty well established. But you can see uh, how the numbers can vary, but there can be upwards to, you know, seven, eight, or nine within one bud, which, of course, can be uh, extremely damaging. S some of the damage from winter moth. When the female moth emerges, uh, she seeks a vertical silhouette, a tree trunk, and she'll race toward it, race up the tree. She emits a pheromone, tracks the males, and what you're seeing here are these clouds of male moths. And this is what we've been experiencing in eastern Massachusetts for the past two to three weeks now. We've been getting many, many reports, and it's looking like this next season is going to be a very heavy winter moth caterpillar season for us. The pheromone has been identified and synthesized, and there are traps that Joe Elkington uses to monitor for this uh, insect. It attracts the males. The female is at the top as she races up the tree, emitting pheromone. The males are attracted to her. They mate. Sometimes she's still racing up the tree, dragging the male along with her. And then when that process is through, she'll begin laying eggs. There are a number of uh, moths that are flying around Thanksgiving time, and they tend to be small and drab, and they don't give us a lot of characteristics. But the uh, fall canker worm, which we started out talking about, the male moth has a little white patch on its wing. The uh, winter moth does not have that. The male winter moth has a band of marks near the posterior end of the wings that are like little hash marks. Bruce spanworm on the right is a native insect. It's in the same genus as winter moth, but it's native here and uh, really is not problematic, but we do see it. I get these at my porch light around Thanksgiving time. They have a, a dark band that's highlighted here, a little mark on the vein that 
that stands out. Once these moths have been active for two or three days, they lose a lot of their scales and uh, some of this becomes very difficult to discern. And I'll move on for the sake of time. Uh, winter moth females are said to be wingless, but as you can see in the uh, center picture, uh, the better picture, they do have these very stubby wings where fall canker worm is completely wingless. Here are the little uh, remnants of the uh, winter moth female wings where fall canker worm is completely wingless. Robert, give it a second. I'm not sure. I, I actually have had a little challenges here, too. I was trying to prepare some poll questions for our next speaker, and I don't know what's going on. So let's just give it a moment. Um, we have one question from Joe oh, Miller, okay. and he's wondering, what is, what is the timing of maple versus oak versus blueberry budding, and how, you know, how would that affect the, um, the amount of winter moths that might be out there? and the feeding. I believe that's something that, that's not really well understood at this time, especially here in Massachusetts. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have an answer for that. And, and I don't specifically work with blueberries, so I, I can't say for sure. So, I apologize for that. We mostly follow growing degree days, and we, um, we like to know before they're active and trying to wriggle into buds because that can be an important timing for uh, managing them, especially in blueberries where it's essential to, to manage them before they enter the buds. Uh, tree banding for the adult females. Uh, Joe Alkinton has, has had a number of years now of study where he takes these bands that have the, uh, the fiber batting, they're wrapped tightly around the tree, and as the female runs up the tree, she encounters this white batting, can't crawl under it, tries to go out around it. As you can see, it's rather thick. Then there's this film. Uh, around that band that hangs under the fiber band and it uh, is sticky on the inside. So as the female tries to get up around the, the cottony band or the fibrous band, she hits the uh, stickum and is stuck there. So it's a great way of sampling. And there are two bands on this tree to see if any were able to get past the first band. Okay, I don't know why that's happening. Let me see if I can... For some reason, I'm able to do it. Laura, are you not able to advance? Just let me know what I can do. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, well, this is great. This is uh, Jeff Bettner with two bands from one tree that I think okay. you can probably see uh, are loaded with moths. All right. And if you could advance the slide for me, Laura, that'd be great. I may have to have you do it. It's not responding. This is just a close-up, and if you'd advance again, there are males and females on there. And at the bottom of this band now, on the bottom left, you can see there's all this red stuff on there. And if you would uh, advance that for me, we'll see that a close-up that even though the females were stuck there, they continued to just spew out eggs, thousands and thousands of eggs. Uh, each female produces about 150 eggs. Uh, and those two bands that Jeff is holding uh, both filled up within an hour. The, uh, the first band uh, filled up so much that the new moths were able to run over the stuck bodies on the first band and get up to the second band. And if you'd advance for me. And this is some of the work that uh, Joe's been doing for the past several years on that. Uh, and as you can see, the population since 2005 of winter moth in three towns has been going downward. But then in 2008, it started going up again. There is some 
moderating factor to population size that's not understood yet here in Massachusetts, what the natural or environmental causes are. But right now, we're expecting a banner year. As you can see, our Joe's data only goes to November 27th, and there was some significant activity after that. Advance. So just some quick numbers. Uh, very high density. Uh, in 2004, he was getting 1,000 to 1,600 female moths per tree. So far this year, on uh, in some towns, Hanson, Mass, uh, he's captured 900 females in just four days. Uh, so we can be looking at you know 150 plus thousand eggs per tree uh, with these kind of population densities. No, oh, good. So how are we going to manage this insect? We're going to monitor for its presence. This is key. We have to know it's there. And we need to be familiar with all of the life stages. Laura, can you advance for me? It's, there we go. Uh, the moths are very obvious. The eggs can be difficult uh, once we get into late winter. Uh, by the time we see free feeding caterpillars, it may be too late, especially if it's a high density year. Forward. Uh, for blueberry growers, we've been recommending a horticultural oil spray for the overwintering eggs, and some of the growers have been adding uh, a chemical within the spray tank, and they try to tie, time their spray just before hatch. So if, if the oil doesn't cover all of the eggs, and it probably won't, that the uh, caterpillars that are successful in hatching from eggs, the uh, chemical companion, which might be a organo an organophosphate or uh, pyrethroid, whatever's labeled for blueberries and, and mixes with oil, perhaps even spinosad. BT works, but it, the, it will not work when the larvae are inside of the bud, and that's uh, where a lot of damage can occur, sometimes uh, significant damage. Spinosad products uh, for trees and shrubs, it's conserve, which is the commercial version. There are a number of homeowner versions. And trust is an organic version of, or a label for uh, spinosad products, and it works remarkably well on all uh, caterpillars. Uh, but they have to be free feeders. Uh, Tebufenazide is confirmed. I don't believe it has labeling for blueberries. It's a growth regulator primarily for Lepidopter, and then uh, chemical insecticides, uh, such as the pyrethroids. But again, uh, once they're free feeders, and hopefully it's not too late. And the primary factor that's being looked at are parasitoids. Nova Scotia had remarkable success with using these, these parasitoids. And they are now the controlling factor of winter moth in Nova Scotia. Winter moth is hard to find in Nova Scotia. Laura, I need for you to advance for me. Thank you. So, Xenus albicans is a tachinid fly. It's a specialist. It's only known uh, host is winter moth. Agrippon is an ichneumonid wasp, and it's a generalist. And uh, it may be here already. We're not sure. But all the work here is being done with Cyzenus. Can you advance? Thank you. And once more. Thank you. Uh, from Nova Scotia, again, I got this uh, slide from Joe Elkinton. You can see that in 54, they started releases of both of these parasitoids. And, and once they got into 1962 and 63, winter moth populations were, were extremely low. And uh, the controlling factor, again, is this fly. They mass reared and released it uh, over 8 or 10 years and uh, got very good successes with it. The fly seeks out winter moth caterpillars, and it, it know it using the uh, olfactory cues. It picks up on where winter moth is feeding. Well, can you advance for me? And it lays its eggs on the foliage. This is these are three eggs, highly magnified. Advance once more. Once more. Thank you. That tiny dot is an egg of the Cyzenus. And as the winter moth caterpillar feeds, it ingests the egg, 
once the egg is in the gut of the caterpillar, it will hatch, and then the fly maggot uh, continues to consume and kill the winter moth caterpillar. Advance. And these are uh, six sites now where Joe Elkington has released Cyzenus. And he has uh, been able to retrieve some in following years, very low numbers so far. But his goal is to continue mass rearing these and to continue releasing them. Um, uh, you Laura, I have a bit more to go, but I'm concerned about time. I think we'll be okay. I don't want to cut yep. into Roger's time. Okay. Yeah, I will. Okay, if you'd advance for me, just, just tell me when I'm finished. Thank you. So, you, I've covered this, so you may continue. Oh, I'm done. <laughs> I'm sorry, Laura. Uh, I had a, this is our website at UMass Green Info. It is on the, uh, the handout that is uh, posted here at this website. Um, and uh, if you want to read more about winter moth and All right. learn some resources, thank you so much, and, uh, Bob. Uh, also, there's a couple uh, of questions um, is doing uh, primary that research maybe here. you could talk to. Um, thank you. Carl DePolt Thank is you. wondering uh, about certified wildlife habitats, and he's interested in growing various types of berries to promote wildlife habitat. Uh, this That question, perhaps, Carl, we can hold for a second, but maybe your next question. Um, at this time of the year, I noticed that blueberries are coming from Chile and Argentina. What sorts of pest concerns do they have in the southern hemisphere? I don't know if you uh, have a comment about that, Bob. Uh -huh. um. Well, I don't. You know, as I, I, I stated at the beginning, I, I don't work with blueberries. I, um, incidentally, you know, I wound up working with some of the blueberry growers trying to help them with this winter moth, but I... Virtually okay. all of my work I, with Carl, winter moth I don't know has the answer to that question either. With um, it feeding on but we can, I can uh, deciduous trees. Yeah. Yeah. I know, uh, I'm not sure if Sonia Sh Schloman is still yeah, and if with anybody, us. If I saw any she was earlier. Um, would like to but join she may us. have, have some input for I that. I could turn on your microphone for you, but just... Give me a little check mark or something if you'd like to comment uh, through the audio. Otherwise, if you could type something in. We do have a couple of other questions. Um, is anyone looking for the winter moth in the lakes regions of New York State? Do you, or even in eastern New York, which I'm somewhat concerned about. I have not been looking for it. But do you know, Bob, if there's any um, larger regional scouting going on for this pest? Well, I know that the pheromone trapping was pretty widespread, uh, but I think it was mostly done in areas where it was suspected and, and also where it's established, you know, in other parts of the world. Uh, I, it was picked up uh, in two sites in Long Island for the past couple of years, but, uh, you know, the extension people there were, were completely unaware they had okay. winter moth, and um, still, a, if it wasn't for the trapping, they wouldn't know it. Uh, it's okay. a very, very low um, number. Pam there. Gianetti has a question: If females, so no, I don't that know if anything is being done in the late spray region. used in late November to help control or reduce the population. They emerge over. Uh, a fairly lengthy time. Um, it starts, it can start about the, first, the week before Thanksgiving, uh, and it can go into January. And I guess it's possible that you could spray pyrethroids at that time, uh, or, you know, a knockdown type spray. The weather, you know, we have freezing nights, uh, and I don't know how conducive it would be to those conditions are for using uh, products like that at that time. Also, it depends on where your, what surrounds your blueberry fields. And if you have uh, forested areas, 
especially if you have maples or oaks, uh, you may be successful at treating what is on your blueberry, but uh, you may have blow-in, ballooning, drop-down uh, from the surrounding trees once they hatch out. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very frustrating pest. I was talking a lot to the, blue, excuse me, to the blueberry growers in southeastern Mass for uh, two or three years when this was so problematic. And the bottom line is that it's very frustrating. You have to be on it daily. Uh, especially when they're they're hatching and or about to hatch and just stay after it, monitor the buds, see if they're getting into the buds, because uh, that is really the crucial time. Once the buds open, you know, if, if we don't have a big problem, uh, but once the buds open, we can treat them like we would any right. other lepidopter um, caterpillar, and it, it's quite easy to manage. Uh, them. There's one other question from Jeff Miller. What is the timing for the release of predators? Uh, well, it's actually a parasitoid, and it's released uh, a week or so before the, uh, the winter moth caterpillar is going to finish feeding and drop to pupate. So fairly mature caterpillars. And it, it, here it would be uh, okay, about the third week and in May. And I should have said um, parasitoid. Maybe the so last week the in other May. question from Carl is there are there bird species or any other natural predator that feed on the winter moth? That's okay. We do see uh, different birds in in trees or bushes picking away at winter moth, but it's once the foliage is opened and and uh, they're obvious and free feeders, uh, but it doesn't seem to make a big difference. The population numbers become excessive and very, very damaging. One of the points I wanted to make is that we have had consecutive years of winter moth in southeastern Mass uh, on the oaks and the maples primarily, and we have just thousands and thousands of dead trees now. The trees were so weakened that they succumbed to other secondary factors and they've become a huge liability for the utility companies and these dead trees threaten the, the power lines. Yeah, I can attest it's, to that, uh, having been in, in it's um, been pretty New serious England in that regard. Thanksgiving and, and over the summer it really is quite quite amazing. Um, I'm going to cut off questions now. We might be able to get to some of them after Dr. Williams um, uh, presentation. Uh, Bob Childs, thank you so much for telling us about this pest. And now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. And I want to apologize to all of you. Um, Dr. Williams had some poll questions for us, but for some reason the polls are not working today. The pods won't open up properly for me, so we're going to have to bypass that. And I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Roger Williams, who is from The Ohio State University. His focus of his research is to develop better insect management practices for the small fruit growers in Ohio. And he's been involved in developing IPM techniques through the employ employment of biorationals, attractant attractants and biocontrol measures. Um, presently, he's studying the efficacy of various nematodes to control grape root borer um, and also investigating the use of parasitic nematodes in the management of the raspberry crown borer. But today he's going to be talking to us about managing Japanese beetles and different strategies for that pest, which is um, a serious pest. And Dr. Williams, I do want to let you know that you have the full half hour. Uh, don't worry about the time. We don't get cut off. And then we can have a little bit of question and answer at the end of that. So thank you very much for joining us. Okay, well thank you and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, here in Ohio we've kind of missed the storm so far but it's heading this way it looks like. So uh, right now we're, our roads are pretty good. Uh, I'm the small fruit entomologist from here in uh, northern Ohio connected with Ohio State University, we call it OARDC, and uh, work primarily with grapes, blueberries, brambles, and strawberries. <coughs> Excuse me, as you will see on the slides, 
we do have very serious problems with Japanese beetles in Ohio and also in the neighboring states. It is one of the most problematic pests that we will see and one of the reasons is that it attacks so many different crops. Uh, and another reason probably is that so many people know what the Japanese beetle is because they've seen it in their yards eating on a lot of different plants. I also work with the Japanese beetle problem that we have in the Azores and that has uh, been going on for since the 70s uh, and it originally came in there at the US Air Force Base and uh, that we have in the Azores on Terceira Island. So we're pretty sure that we're the guilty ones of bringing it in there on some of our jet planes and now it's all over the the Azores uh, on the nine different islands and the Azores are about uh, three quarters of the way over from between New Jersey and Lisbon. Uh, right can you get yours to it uh, advance? Is your uh, slide set advancing? Let's see here. Oh, I got to do this. The yes, there. Oh, I don't want it. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Wait a minute. Yep, it's working. Uh, as most of you know, the the Japanese beetle arrived here in the U.S sometime between uh, 1910 and 1916. It was first really discovered in 1916 I guess in southern New Jersey and thus the first Japanese beetle laboratory was established there in New Jersey. Uh, as the Japanese beetle moved west the USDA Japanese beetle lab moved here to Worcester, Ohio and uh, so it's still mostly here they go by a different name, but still there's several people here that work with Japanese beetles. Uh, uh, it is still on the move, and it's uh, moved north up into Michigan over the last few years. Uh, it is a terrible pest of blueberries and other small fruits in Ohio and surrounding states. Uh, Michigan leads the nation in production of high bl bush blueberries. Uh, I'm not sure that this the most recent data, but because uh, I know Georgia has planted an awful lot of blueberries with the help of Michigan uh, companies and growers. But at the time this was published, uh, they had about 40% of the U.S. crop. Uh, however, uh, financial uh, security of the Michigan berry industry was threatened by the recent invasion of the Japanese beetle which happened something like 10 or 12 years ago and uh, it's now into the major centers where the commercial blueberries are raised there in Michigan uh, not too far off of uh, Lake Michigan there on that side and the they produce a lot of uh, fresh fruit and some of it's uh, even exported and so forth. They've tried uh, a lot of different things on the Japanese beetles to keep them down but have trouble with uh, residues so they they keep working on on better systems to do that. Uh, m much of the Michigan crop is harvested mechanically and this has led to some unique problems. Uh, one of them is that it, of course, skeletonizes the leaves like it does on grapes and other, many other things and uh, makes the fruit unsaleable where it uh, bites off the skin and leaves the fruit, white fruit exposed there. Another problem is, and this is one that I had a hard time believing, was that Japanese beetles were getting inside of the berries and they couldn't be found on the conveyor belts. So they did everything from changing the color of the conveyor belts to changing the lights overhead and still they had difficulties uh, with that uh, process. But uh, why do the berries go inside of the beetles, uh, the, uh, inside of the berries? Uh, nobody seems to uh, 
know that here in Ohio because we don't uh, mechanically harvest. So that's why I kind of doubted it when I first heard it, but then I was invited over to, to really see it at one of the processing companies nearby. Uh, and uh, what happens is that the the berries are mechanically harvested and then immediately taken into the cold storage room. Well, when they're harvested, of course, that knocks down a lot of Japanese beetles with the uh, with the blueberries. And so evidently what happens, they're looking for a warmer home and they uh, dig their way inside of the berries themselves and conceal themselves. Uh, the adults feed on the foliage, fruit, and flowers of more than 300 kinds of plants, but uh, blueberries and grapes are two of their preferred hosts. Uh, the larvae are C-shaped grubs in the soil and do serious damage, especially to grasses. And their distinguishing characters of uh, the grubs are, of course, the rastral pattern, which is right under the, the underside of the tip. And on Japanese beetles, it's shaped like a V. It's pretty easy to distinguish from most others. And then the adult beetle, of course, is metallic green. Uh, and uh, coppery brown wing covers, tufts of white hair along the edge of the sides of the body. The adults are about a half an inch long, but after you haven't worked with them for a while, you start thinking they're larger and larger because they're so much of a uh, problem to our growers. Uh, the uh, larvae feed principally on grass roots, as I mentioned before, and they show up, the adults show up around the same time that we start seeing ripe blueberries here in northern Ohio, and that's around the 4th of July. So at that time when the females emerge from the soil, the eggs, uh, uh, they, they mate uh, very close to that time because the males are so strongly attracted to them that you'll see just a, a, um, a lot of activity on the ground as the females, the virgin females, come up. And uh, so that uh, makes it for interesting behavior of them. And uh, then at the winter time they go down from 3 to 12 inches in the soil the larvae do and come up in the, the following spring. Uh, there is but one generation a year here in northern Ohio, however, in some colder areas come different states, uh, it takes two years to complete the life cycle further north and where it's a lot colder than it is here. Uh, the Beetles prefer foliage exposed to direct sunlight and often are seen clustered together feeding on tender vegetative part. Damaged leaves have a laced appearance and severely affected leaves will drop off. This is the same for blueberries or, or for, for grapes that we work with a lot. Uh, let's see here. in southern Ontario and northern New England and the Adirondacks uh, of western regions of New York uh, are, that are unusually cold uh, and also in southern New England portions it takes two years to complete the life cycle. Uh, maybe that would be useful here too if we could maybe we could get rid of them for one year. But uh, the last three years we have seen a lot of Japanese beetles, especially right here at Worcester because we've had just about the right amount of rain and uh, so forth. So it's it's really been a hectic time for us and we've seen a lot. Now this varies from area to area of course, uh, but uh, the last two years prior to 2009 were really bad. Uh, as you go further south then you get uh, earlier emergence as you would expect and uh, in southern Georgia they and uh, they may come out in, in early May, in May and uh, mid-June North Carolina and Kentucky uh, but uh, 
until uh, July in eastern Massachusetts and, and Ohio in this area this far north. Males begin to emerge a few days uh, earlier than females and the sex ratio of adults emerging in the field is about one to one. Uh, to control the Japanese beetles and uh, fruit, other fruit insects, uh, I recommend that you go to your local extension uh, publications because some things are legal in some places and not in other. So, for example, Ohio and New York have pretty different regulations due to their restrictions that they have there. Okay, uh, despite the uh, concerns of the federal and states uh, to eradicate it, uh, then to limit it, it, it sp its spread, the JB progress progressively extended its range and now it is in most of widespread and destructive insect pest of turf and landscape plants in the eastern United States. More than 460 million dollars is expended each year for direct control cost and for renovating or replacing damaged turf and ornamental plants. Japanese beetles also damage fruit crops, soybeans, maize, and other gardens and field crops. Larvae and adults are targets for a substantial insecticide usage, especially on home lawns, golf courses, and urban landscapes. Uh, and the... I think I'll switch to the next one. Some research that we've done uh, here and and the surrounding states, we picked this uh, information up, and I think most of this is in our uh, air label book for the Midwest Commercial Small Fruit and Grape Spray Guide 2009, and it'll soon be out in the 2010 version, but. If you wanted to know more on the uh, pesticides for blueberries, you could go to that on the website, this Midwest Commercial Small Fruit and Grape Spray Guide. Uh, the most common one here is 7XLR, and uh, seven, the XLR uh, type of 7 is the best because it'll hold on leaves that are more or less uh, waxy or slick such as some of the grape leaves and most of the blueberry leaves. So 7 does a good job but you do have some uh, problems there if you're doing it at harvest because you have to wait 7 days if you use 7 and uh, so that's one of the holdbacks on it. Uh, but there's other things that you can use that do a pretty good job and so w if you want to harvest real soon after spraying then you sh you've got to watch the the uh, the PHI on those those uh, different uh, pesticides. Uh, I think all of those that are listed there are labeled for blueberries in at least in Ohio and somewhere or another. Uh, the Mustang Max is labeled for other insects not Japanese beetle but it could be used for the other insects. Okay, uh, seasonal trapping of Japanese beetle. This is more or less uh, systematic in that uh, most of our peaks for Japanese beetle come out sometime in uh, August there usually. But uh, this year I was just over in Portugal in, uh, in uh, November and uh, on the Azores there they had noticed something really strange about their population because the peaks all were in late September and uh, we never have 
experienced them quite that late. We've, we've seen them range into there, but most of it is usually in August. So we're not sure exactly why the peaks are changing, but they speculate that maybe global warming is having something to do with it out there in the Azores. Alright, that's just uh, to kind of give you an idea of where you might be able to control Japanese beetles either in the grub stage and which methods you could use and also in the adult stage. I'll go over that a little bit more as we go into the other th slides. Another option here for controlling spores, and this is particularly in high value places such as golf course greens and so forth, milky spore could be used. <coughs> uh, milky spore is of course uh, pretty expensive and it was actually taken off the market here about 10 years ago because they started checking the shelf life of some of the milky spore disease that was for sale and uh, it wasn't up to snuff so uh, the USDA made them take it off and then be checked so now the spore counts are up and it, it looks like it's uh, working much better but you can run up something like three hundred fifty three hundred sixty dollars an acre if you put it down the way they recommend in lines uh, even on golf courses or your backyard or something like that so not very many people do it and then of course the other thing you have to worry about on the Japanese beetle is that the adults are such strong flyers that you're not going to really do yourself very much good uh, by putting it in your yard and uh, to to rid yourself of the adults anyway you might get rid of the grubs but the adults are going to be flying into your roses and, and other things anyway uh, one of the tests that we did this past summer uh, with the blueberry grower here, we were trying to look at some different uh, fungi that would uh, might control Japanese beetles. So we used typical Japanese beetle trap on top of this uh, auto dissemination trap. And as you can see, it's kind of a... a interesting uh, makeup of it. It's not too easy to go through, but uh, the Japanese beetles come into their lures and then they fall down. Let me use the... Where is my uh, thing? Oh, I didn't get it. I'm trying to get my pointer. Now I got it. Uh, the Japanese beetles uh, fall down into here and uh, this seems to have a little bit more room than the ones we made here but they're the same design actually except that they have a thicker um, top and bottom and then this little door right here is where you put your petri dish in full of your either bovaria like we used or the metaresium which we use in uh, the azores so the the beetles fall fall down they come down into here and the main problem or one of the problems could be water because it collects rainfall and just forces it down so underneath this there's a screen uh, to let the water out then the beetles are supposed to walk across this petri dish that's inside this door being attracted out to this light over here that's just a piece of glass in there and this is just open for them to fall out of the bottom and uh, so that uh, that works pretty good and we've, we've done our test by by using this uh, in Oklahoma uh, uh, it's been three or four years ago they had such dry conditions and so forth they decided to that they would use a wet auger uh, petri dish and put it in as the spores were developing uh, so that they wouldn't get blown around so much and uh, so they designed a new trap uh, auto dissemination trap which was made out of PVC pipe and uh, it worked pretty good but they didn't really do enough testing to know if it was going to be satisfactory 
for you know killing a lot of beetles. Uh, here we have just a, a slide just mentioning that we have uh, a fly and also a uh, little wasp that uh, that uh, also that attack the uh, the, the Japanese beetle. They've been introduced and they do a fairly good job, uh, a fair job I might say, on one of the golf courses or several of the golf courses I believe up in Connecticut. We've tried to introduce them into Ohio and we have had absolutely no luck in getting anything established. They've moved them uh, to the mountain areas near Boone, North Carolina and there's an area up in there five or six miles that is supposed to have pretty good control from these uh, parasites and predators. Uh, the pheromone is uh, something that was developed here uh, in Worcester by T. Ladd and uh, Mick Klein. Some of you probably know them. And so th they're used along with the feeding uh, attractant to uh, to attract in uh, the beetles uh, to our auto dissemination traps. Okay, okay this one was put in uh, and then we did, uh, didn't take it back out but unfortunately this was developed and they actually isolated something that would uh, shut down the identification of the pheromone and uh, so that you it couldn't be detected but uh, it worked in the laboratory but it wasn't field tested so after some more testing and maybe using some different methods they'll be able to work something out the guy that developed this is one of the leading uh, guys on beetle especially uh, scarab uh, pheromones and so he's really good at it and he thinks that this has some real possibilities. Uh, nematodes are another thing that are useful in uh, especially in golf courses and high value places. And We have a scientist here by the name of uh, Parwinder Grewal who's working on that aspect and having some pretty good luck as far as golf greens and things like that and using it on a lot of different insects. Okay. Uh, the material that we've been using in this auto dissemination trap is uh, a bovaria and we've been using bovaria here and over in the Azores we've been using uh, can't think of the name of it right now. Macrodac, huh? Metaresium, metaresium. Uh, they're kind of similar. Uh, the uh, Bovaria is uh, gives white spores, and this company that we, I wasn't familiar with until recently has helped us uh, and supplied us with material, and we're kind of uh, happy with that. And uh, it we didn't change the formulation at all we just used what came commercially and uh, that's what we put our traps out with we set our traps out using their their products and here again this is the trap uh, that we used the, about the only difference from the one uh, that's been used before uh, there in the Azores it is this trap is a different kind of Japanese beetle trap and it actually goes down inside a little bit and that makes it a little bit restricted there but here you can see that we we use sponges and we put the mixtures in the with water usually uh, and the the sponge in there and let the the beetles would walk from uh, let me get the pointer here okay the beetles come down in through here and then they get clogged up there a little bit if there's too many of them but anyway they're supposed to walk inside over this 
sponge or without the sponge. Some of them we had it out in just plain water for the check. And then would they be released? Actually, would usually plans are in the future they would, they, they would just be released. Here we were collecting them so we could do bioassays in the lab on them. Okay. And here you can see another one. Here you can see down inside of a trap showing the number of beetles that actually built up there a little bit and so when they build up too much sometimes they can get away but uh, that's basically what it looks like you can see underneath here where the uh, most a lot of them were congregating I'm not showing you with your I'm not having any luck now I think I've got it <laughs> anyway uh, right under the trap uh, there we put some uh, duct tape there because too many of them were congregating there trying to get out rather than going down to the other end and walking through the the fungus to get out and that worked pretty well here you can see a little bit uh, different uh, situations where the uh, how the trap was set up and uh, we used just regular uh, ring jars or canisters on the bottom to collect them when we were going to do some tests with them. These are the different uh, different uh, treatments that we use, the different five different treatments. The first one we had the spray uh, in a petri dish, sponge in a petri dish. Second one, no sponge. The third one uh, with a sponge at a different concentration and then the fourth one was the powder uh, in the petri dish and that had uh, without water and without sponge and so that was this one here which did the best and that was just the powder itself with not not works with mixed with water and with no sponge so you can see I need to get my pointer here okay so these right here these tall this tall one uh, that was the best and that was just the powder that they sold okay so uh, I'll go to the next slide there but anyway you can see that the, the ones where we mix water in the sponge uh, didn't do as good and that's just a later version of it we we put those did that uh, bio essay on the 27th of August and then the 7th of September we did another one this is what the Japanese beetles look like uh, that have it now if this was metaresium of course these would be green spores but look look very similar just a little bit closer up uh, picture of those but you can still tell that they're Japanese beetles uh, Roger yeah actually so keep your um, your microphone on for a sec because I think we have a couple one. of questions so um, there uh, were there was one interesting Carl's one and uh, Carl asks yeah. how does increasing the soil organic matter help to manage the Japanese beetle population okay. can you speak to that at all Uh, well, the Japanese beetle grubs, they kind of thrive on organic matter. So, uh, okay. it depends, you know, if it's the kind that they like or not, but they really like grass uh, roots. I think that's their preference. Yeah, it seems like it might uh, not, eating. so that's a, that's a good but, thing. But uh, I really um, can't tell you how the organic matter would help reduce them. I can't think of a way. Yeah. 
Yeah, and the, like the the green June bug, th you know, thrives on the okay, underside great. of Thank bales you. of hay. There, um, and, and a so couple of like the that. questions so that were asked earlier it, in the presentation, in for example, matter, is the springtiffia wasp. Uh, I think that was mentioned as a way to uh, manage Japanese beetles. And there was another question about. Um, Tachnid flies specifically, and I'm not sure if that was the species of fly that is uh, helpful in controlling Japanese beetles, Roger? Yeah, both of these things are good, and we've really we've we tried you know many times to introduce them into the Azores, where we figured the climate would be a little bit milder, and then we've tried to introduce them here into Worcester, where we have you know moderately cold climate, and we have just haven't done very much good at all. So it's just a hit or miss thing. Now, uh, whether they can be counted on, I don't know, but there were that. One okay. is uh, established in uh, Connecticut. Yeah. Um, is there a grab you know, crop that is effective for blueberries? That, that was course. one of the questions. But uh, I don't know of any widespread thing. I, I know we usually just say put raspberries <laughs> near them, but. <laughs> a trap crop. Ooh. Yeah. And then I have a question. It was a comment made yeah. um, privately, but. It, do you yeah, know I, if they've tried using infrared on uh, conveyor right belts hand. to see uh, if that actually it, pops it, the Japanese beetles? Apparently, this technology is being used to control some pests of grains. I okay. do not know that. Uh, yeah, I really and don't. then we've I got um, a question about the effectiveness it, of milky you know, spore in colder but, climates. Uh, Many sure. of the folks that are logged on can't, are actually uh, from New England area and New, upstate New York. Do you, um, I know that in there was some studies done at Cornell that implied that milky spore was not very effective. Uh, it just didn't get the, it didn't mm -hmm. build up enough of a population. Have you read anything more recently? No, I haven't. The, the The latest thing I've person I've talked to that's knowledgeable on that is Mick Klein, and he seems to think here, you know, for the the conditions we have here, which are pretty cold, uh, that it's working pretty good now. But for a while there, the shelf life uh, just wasn't any good, and so they made them step that up. And now they they, then right. they released it for them to sell it. And actually, again. we have a. And I just wonder yeah. if the studies could have been done. I'm at sorry that time for interrupting. I just I was reading down. this um, thing from Satnam Basra. He again. comments that infrared yeah, was used um, okay. at a, a nursery farm in Michigan, and so that's really interesting to to see that that was yeah. Um, th there are a number of different questions, Carl, primarily about yeah, um, kind that of is interesting effectiveness of vertebrate and invertebrate predators. I'm assuming you're talking about birds and I think the invertebrates we've talked a little bit about nematodes and other kinds of um, parasites and other natural controls. Um, and then there's one more. No-till. Does no-till have adverse or beneficial impacts on Japanese beetle population? Uh, I don't know if that's been... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, no-till would not uh, be, you know, right. very uh, good because it would allow the grasses to grow in there unless you came in and wiped out the grasses too. But uh, we've seen some All things right. where no-till makes the insect problems worse, you know. And uh, 
So I don't know. Well, I, I um, because we're starting to run out of time, and I'm sorry to cut you the questions off, but I just want to make sure that people have time to download the information sheets that I, we mentioned briefly at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any additional questions for Robert Childs or Roger Williams. I am very happy that they took time out to um, get their presentations ready and uh, practice and, and learn this new kind of uh, delivery technique. But I uh, am very, very happy that you folks uh, participated. I also want to remind everybody that we've got quite a long break here for the holidays before our last series um, of webinars on brambles, which begin on Wednesday, January 6th. In order to kind of keep momentum up, you may see some emails during the holidays from me to remind you. I will try not to be obnoxious with them, but I don't want people to forget about Maybe they come. I've lost my auto. She lost hers. Can you hear me now? <laughs> oh, somebody said yes, they could hear me now. <laughs> Oh, 
I can hear, okay, Laura can hear now. Well, I don't know if anybody can hear or not, but anyway, uh, I thank everyone for showing up and putting up with us, and uh, hope everybody will have a, a good uh, day tomorrow. <laughs> Somebody's typing. How come I can't hear anything? Because I haven't turned anything off. The number's going down, so people are signing up. I can hear you. Learn to say. Hi, Roger. I got my audio back. I don't know what happened, but <laughs> I want to thank you, um, and I apologize about the polls. I'm not sure what happened with them, but they just completely froze up, and we had some other little weird things that happened um, during the presentation, but I'm glad that you weren't affected, and um, I hope you have a great holiday season. So thanks again for being part of this.